uh, kicked off. Uh, let's let's do it. So um, I don't know what it is for everybody, but I know for me it's <laughs> it's an evening. I think. Um, so uh, good evening, good morning for everybody, uh, afternoon. So um, we've got a few things in the action item review. Uh, again, we'll sort of remind people about the December Hackfest um, and the preparations for that. I think we're still looking for a venue, so Todd will cover that. Um, uh, brief reminder of the Hyperledger wiki migration uh, that's underway and communication tools. And then uh, Richard um, is going to go over um, R3 Corda platform and introduce that for us. Um, and materials are hosted in the wiki there. Um, and maybe somebody could post that link into the uh, to the chat so people can dive in. Um, and then uh, Vipin is Vipin on. Oh, yep, there he is. Um, so Vipin will go over his uh, proposal for a numbering scheme for the uh, Hyperledger improvement pro uh, proposals, and um, and then Arno um, would like to discuss briefly some changes to the incident procedure in the code of conduct, because I think there's a number of other projects at Linux Foundation that are interested in maybe leveraging our code of conduct. And uh, then finally, if we have time left, we'll have work group updates. So, uh, Todd, you want to kick it off with the Hackfest reminder? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, we'll move pretty quickly through this. Uh, for the Hackfest, um, we're still targeting December 5th and 6th in New York. Uh, we think we have a, a location identified for that. We're just uh, finalizing a, a couple remaining questions, and we'll update the group as soon as that's confirmed. Uh, onward from there, uh, the wiki migration has begun as we updated last week. We've locked down the old wiki on GitHub. Uh, so if you are one of the work group leads or had a substantial amount of content over there, if you can uh, go to the old wiki and continue to migrate that over. I know a lot has already moved, but there are still a few straggling things uh, and we'll continue to work as well to, to get that done. Uh, and then the last thing, uh, as it relates to communication tools, and Brian, I don't know if you have anything to add here, uh, but if you have not signed up for an account for uh, Discourse, uh, which is at discuss.hyperledger.org, please do so. Continue to test out that platform. Let us know your feedback, uh, good, bad, uh, whatnot. We want to see if that's a viable solution uh, to use moving forward. And Brian, I don't know if you have, Brian or Chris, I don't know if you have anything to add on to that. Nope. No, just uh, let's check it out. Um, it's not as urgent as the wiki migration stuff, um, and uh, it's also not intended to be necessarily a Slack replacement, but potentially some things that we don't use Mellonless for now that we do use Slack for, we could we could, we could do that there. So that's the frame. Great. And if there's uh, no, I, sorry, go ahead. I was I was just going to add that. Um, you know, one of the concerns I think regarding Slack was that some people couldn't access it from China. Um, the feedback from here seems to be that it isn't a problem. Occasionally, it's a problem, um, but it's not generally a problem. Um, so, um, yeah. So I don't know how you know whether there's any urgency, and I I don't think that we're intending to replace Slack completely, but. Uh, yeah, give it a give it a kick. You know, there's a few people that have piled on to one, but there's still only like one thread, so <laughs> be useful for people to get a a taste of it. Okay, uh, anything else? Uh, that's all on that front. Okay, then uh, I'll kick it off to Richard. <laughs> Hi everybody, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Uh, I can hear you and now I can see your screen. Oops, now I, now I can't. Okay, is, is, I have Richard and I lost Hopefully, it. Okay, uh, so you can't see anything or what can you see? 
It, it was up for a second and then it uh, disappeared. You may just need to reshare it. There's a play button. Okay. Maybe, I may just have to drive it out of the. Somebody. Todd, could you mute but Richard? All right, Richard, you should be the only one with an open line now. Great. Okay. So can you see the screen now? Uh, no. <laughs> oh, dear. Right. How about now? Is it visible? Let's, let's keep trying. So it, it doesn't look like you're sharing anything. There should be um, at the top of your yeah, graph. I see it now. Okay. I can see it now. Don't, don't remove that. Um, right. I won't, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm not going to go for the screen. I'll just go like this. Yep. Yeah. Good. Okay. Um, so, so hi, everybody. Uh, Richard Brown here. So I'll, I'll try to be quick because clearly to introduce a, an entirely new platform um, on, on a call like this in, in a constrained time is, is, is always going to be hard. So, so what, I, what, what, I, what, what I wanted to do was um, just highlight some so, so highlight the thought process that's, that's gone into Tecorda and um, some of the, some of the, the, the key, um, I guess, the, the, the key design some key aspects of the design that, that are different to, to other platforms. The, the reason I, I offered to present um, is, is twofold. Um, we released our introductory white paper um, back in the summer, um, and I offered to present then, but um, scheduling around my vacation and a few other things made it difficult. So, um, so I've, I've owed this update to the Hyperledger um, TSE for, for some time. Um, but today was particularly good timing because we announced um, this morning, um, it, 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 it's on Reuters, if anybody um, wants to search for it, um, R3 announced that Corda will be open sourced. It will be open sourced under the Apache 2 license on November the 30th, and it's our um, it's our desire to to contribute it to the Hyperledger project uh, for consideration for incubation. Um, there are there are still some details we have to work out there, and obviously we um, if, if if we can make that work, we obviously have to go through the the incubation process um, and the incubation approval process. But it's our it's our strong desire to to bring this in as, as another one of the um, the incubated platforms under the, the Hyperledger project umbrella. So I thought now was a good time, now would be a good time to to, to brief the community on, on what this thing is and, um, and and what we are what we're trying to do. So if you're following along on the PDF, um, I've moved to slide two untitled Corda, a unique approach to distributing ledgers. Um, so, so the first thing to point out is um, Corda is, is is a genuinely new platform. It, we built it from the ground up. It's not a fork of of, of another platform. It's not um, it's it's not if you like a, a clone of another platform. It's something we've designed and, and built um, um, from scratch. Um, targeting the, the job virtual machine makes heavy use of a very large number of other open source libraries. But the the the, but the core the, the core Corner is, is is new code, um, but it is a distributed ledger. It's it's not a blockchain as as will come on, but it is a distributed ledger, um, in, and with a particular focus designed to allow parties, identified parties. So as we'll see, the, the, there's the underpinnings here for a permissions network to allow permission parties to record, manage, and synchronize agreements that, that exist between them. So you can think of it as a platform for recording the existence, status, and evolution of, of, of agreements, legal contracts, um, um, the legally binding um, accords between um, identifiable parties. Um, as we'll come on to in the design, um, it's, it's heavily inspired by, and I think, at least I hope, it captures many, if not all, of the benefits of, of what we regard as blockchain platforms, um, but with some very different design choices um, based on an analysis we did with our membership um, some time ago about why we think certain aspects of, of some blockchain designs um, are, 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 are not appropriate for some scenarios. Um, I should point out, I don't, I don't claim or I, I, don't, I don't claim to purport that Pork Recorder is the answer to, to every problem. Um, it, it is different, as people will see, and it's intended to be a, a contribution to the, um, the diversity of code bases that we'll see, um, that we'll, we'll see for the foreseeable future. Um, as I said, it's um, our intention to open source it on November the 30th and um, to, 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 um, to contribute it to the, the Hyperledger project um, if, we, um, if, if, we, um, if, if, if the TSC agrees to, to bring it in for incubation. Um, to, to get to get our heads around um, what the what the underlying philosophy, or the underlying design of of of, of Corda is, and, and why it works the way it does, um, it's useful to go back to a, a key question that that we and our and our, and our members 
um, um, thought deeply about um, at, the, at the end of last year. Um, and the question, the question we asked ourselves, and if, if anybody was on the, um, the white paper call yesterday, you'll have heard me make a similar point yesterday. The question we asked ourselves was, there is so much hype and excitement around um, blockchains and distributed ledgers, um, but none of the original platforms, whether that is Bitcoin or Ethereum or, or even Ripple to some extent, um, but certainly Bitcoin and Ethereum, none of them were designed with the express aim of, of, of solving problems that, um, that, 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 that real businesses have and, and regulated financial institutions in particular. But they, but they, but they do solve real problems. You could argue that the, 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 the design goal of Bitcoin was to create a system of censorship resistant digital cash and its architecture satisfies that goal. It's a very specific, very unique, very elegant architecture and it's, and it's a solution to that business problem. How can I create censorship resistant digital cash? Um, if I look at, at Ethereum, Ethereum's architecture has some similarities with Bitcoin but it's also very, very different. And, and my argument and the conclusion we reached in our analysis was that's because publicly, it, it solves a different business problem. The problem that Ethereum is trying to solve, one could argue, is to create a, you know, a, 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 an unstoppable world computer um, from which many other, many other consequences flow. So there's an interesting observation here that um, two, two different platforms with two different sets of business requirements have some commonalities, but they also look very different. Um, so, so as we now look at the um, the application of this technology to, to finance, which was the, um, the, the the brief that was given to us by our members, um, we had to ask ourselves what 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 are the what are the characteristics that that, that unite these blockchain platforms, and and what of them is of particular relevance to finance, and and, and the, the the two key conclusions we we, we reached, which which led to the design of Corda, was that and because both of these, when you hear them, you'll, you'll probably some of you may even roll your eyes because they're, they're they're so obvious, but they have to be said, is that the thing that in our view unites these these different blockchain platforms is that they bring or they allow us to bring groups of, of untrusting parties, parties who don't fully trust each other, bring them into consensus about the existence, the, the nature, and the evolution of a set of shared facts. Um, so in Bitcoin, you know, nobody knows who anybody is and they don't necessarily trust each other, but there's a set of shared facts that everybody comes to consensus on how many Bitcoins are there, who owns them, which addresses own them, rather, who can spend them. On Ethereum, similar threat model, similar model about who trusts each other and who doesn't. But the set of facts is something very different. It's the state of a, of a, of a global shared virtual computer. But that model kind of fits. Um, but the, the entry point to Corda is then to ask ourselves, well, if we've got this, if this genuinely is a new space, this decentralized database space, if you like this distributed ledger space, if this new space is, a, um, is, is, is one where we can bring parties who don't fully trust each other into consensus about the evolution and existence of, of a set of shared facts, what are those shared facts that are pertinent in finance? And, and again, Again, you can say the obvious is, is, is the, the, the answer is obvious, but it has to be said. The set of shared facts of relevance in finance are pretty much every piece of data that finance processes. It's, it, it's the contract, it's the web of legal contracts that exist between financial entities and their clients. Um, if I if I have a balance in a bank, that is a, a contract between me and the bank that says the bank owes me the money. If I have a um, if I've entered into an interest rate swap, perhaps um, between sort of a corporate customer. And Bank, then, then there's also a contract that needs to be managed. So, so the so the challenge we set ourselves was, um, um, or rather the conclusion we reached was, yes, distributed ledgers and blockchain technology look to have huge value when applied to business because if we can come to consensus about these shared facts, then we don't need to record them multiple times in different systems and and, and deal with all the discrepancies and, and all the all the risk that, that follows. Um, and we know what the underlying building block needs to be. It's, it's, it's this idea of, of shared agreements, these, these, these shared facts. The reason why we then began work on prototyping that ultimately led to Corda was the, the observation that it does not follow, therefore, that those architectures that were designed to solve Obviously, the answer for this problem that that, um, that that I've just articulated in finance, and, and some of the and some of the reasons for that are ones that, of course, have been well well rehearsed um, in different ways um, by by the the, the Hyperledger project and the TSC. Things like whereas the Bitcoin and blockchain and Ethereum architecture requires all data to be shared with all parties, at least in their early incarnations, uh, that's not appropriate. Where you where you have um, obligations to your clients for privacy. Um, in reality, business contracts, for example, often require a multi-step process of 
negotiation and backwards and forwards before we can actually sign to say it's final. So there often needs to be the ability to move things around backwards and forwards rather than just broadcasting transactions. And, and a few other things that we'll get onto as I get into the deck. But, but those thought, that, that thought process is all what led to us to um, prototype and ultimately start building Corda. What I propose to do now, in hopefully in short order, and whisk through these charts quite quickly, is just to give you a taste then of what the fundamental building blocks of, of Corda are, um, and then and then um, and then and then and then describe a few of the features of the end that make it different and, and hopefully interesting to the community, and perhaps something that will be a you know, worthy uh, contribution to the debate. Um, so before I move to, to slide three, I realised that introduction was was quite lengthy, so I'll just pause, make sure there are no questions, and um, maybe Todd, if you can confirm that I actually can be heard, and I haven't been talking to myself. <laughs> yep, yep, we've been able to hear you. And everyone's lines were muted, so you'll just have to Correct. individually unmute uh, if you have questions for Richard. Great, thank you. Okay, so um, so so slide three. Um, this is a very very simplified um idea of you know what we're trying to achieve with Corda. It, it's the idea that um, you know, a deployed Corda network you can think of as just containing and managing a huge number, millions, billions of, um, of what we call state objects. A state object you can think of is a, is a very reductive, it's a very atomic thing. A state object is you know, the fundamental unit of data in Corda um, and, and it, represents, it represents a thing. Um, it's intended to represent an agreement. So, so here you could have um, an agreement that, that represents was intended to represent the existence of a, of a balance at a bank. So we see you know, the first version of this, um, a, a bank, London Bank, has issued £100 US dollars to a customer um, who, who, is, who is exports are limited. And the idea is, you know, the, the thing we are trying to achieve with, with Corda is to ensure that those who need to be in consensus about this fact, in this case, just the bank and just its customer at this point, have that object, they're in consensus about it, and there is no, there's no ambiguity as to whether that is the most current version. And the, the task we're setting ourselves is, as that, as that agreement evolves, perhaps the money is paid from the exporter to another bank, maybe it's paid to a shipper, um, maybe the, um, the, the cash is redeemed for, for, you know, for physical cash or the cash object is redeemed for physical cash or, um, or, or back to a normal bank account. Um, we need to make sure that everybody who needs to know about the, um, the, 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 the status of this object um, have the same one and they know they have, they know they have the same one and there can be no ambiguity. So, so at, a very, at a very high level, you could argue this is a, so far so much like um, quite a few other platforms and we've got the underlying data model, which is you know, a state object that represents a legal agreement. It's visible to and shared only with those who have a legitimate need to see it. I'll define what I mean by legitimate need um, slightly later. Um, and, our, and our objective is to make sure these objects evolve correctly, um, approved by the right people, shared with the right people at the right time. Um, so it's a very, very, very simple underlying objective. Um, so a little bit more on state objects, because these really are the, the, the fundamental building block in the, um, in the architecture. So I'm on slide four now. Um, so this is a, um, an, an, another view of, um, and, we're, and I use cash throughout this, not because it's a necessarily the, the, the dominant or, or most interesting use case, but I think it's something that everyone can, everyone can engage with. Um, um, so, so if I wanted to model the fact here we have you know, $100 this time issued by a different bank, I've like named one here, a Barclays Bank. Um, you know, what does the developer need to do on the platform to make this work? So if you to implement a cash contract on Corda, you define the state object. You know, what are the fields we need to care about? You know, who issued it? What's the amount? What's the currency? Who's the owner? Um, but we also have two, two other specific things that the, um, the developer is expected to include. Um, one is the obvious one, which um, is, the, is, is the reference to the, the governing contract code, as we call it. Think of it as the smart contract code. Um, and this is the code that, that governs its evolution. Now, importantly, and I think in, in contrast to Ethereum-like systems, and I guess in, in contrast to Fabric as well, is that, that, um, that our contracts make a distinction between verification logic and transaction generation logic. And by that, I mean the absolutely minimal thing a developer has to do is, 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 is documenting code verification logic for state transitions. So if I, if I, if I possess um, some, some, some cash issued by a bank that's here, the, the consensus layer um, is concerned with whether, with whether any proposed update to that object, in, in actual fact, um, replacements of that object, because objects are, are um, immutable in the platform, whether any given um, update is valid or not. Um, the, um, 
the, the, the question of how a valid transaction is constructed um, is, is, is deliberately kept as a, as a separate concern. So the, the amount of data on which we have to be, um, or the amount of logic with which we have to be in consensus with our peers is, is deliberately minimized and is um, focused exclusively on verification. For those familiar with the Bitcoin model, it's, it's, it's quite similar to, um, to, to, to the verification model in Bitcoin. Um, and the and the second thing is we always link to governing legal pros. As I said, the um, although this platform is for more general purpose than, than just finance, it was inspired by requirements from finance. And the um, one of the the key things we're trying to achieve is that state objects recorded on the platform, um, correctly signed, correctly notarized as I'll come on to, are legally binding. They are they are authoritative for the facts that they purport to represent and therefore we need to explicitly link to the overarching legal pros from which that um, legal enforceability derives you know, um, so, so what is the governing contract what do we do in the event of disputes um, what happens if something exceptional happens that hasn't been allowed for in the code um, so, so, so building blocks state objects what is the what is the, what are the facts what is a single fact with which we want to be in consensus with somebody else, what is the code that governs its evolution and in the event of dispute or in the event of, um, of, of questions, what's the overarching legal prose that governs it. So again, a very simple, quite deliberately reductive and minimalist um, data model from which the rest of the system builds. Um, I'll pause there for questions before I, before I move on. And so Richard, this is Chris. So what, what form does that take? Because you've got you know, issuer blank and owner blank agree that yada yada yada. Is this um, some form of um, uh, you know like an XML legal uh, you know legal XML document, or is this just a PDF of the contract? Help me, help me understand how this. Yeah. Works. Oh yeah, so really, really, yeah, really good point. And we, and yeah, there's no magic in this. So, so if you're thinking PDF, you're thinking the right thing. So, although there are, and we know there's there's active research by 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 many firms and academics on being able to derive the the executable code from from the legal from the legal domain yeah. and things like that. Um, the the model here is, is is intended to be far simpler. So the legal pros you can think of, and the, the right mental model for this is to think about the old days in which, um, um, in which um, um, sort of you know, household insurance was sold. You go to a broker and they had a stack of paper, which was the insurance policy with the, the details left blank. Um, and then while you sat there, the, the broker would fill in the details and then stamp it at the bottom. So you can think of the legal pros as being a template, a PDF template, and the, the state object filling in the gaps. So that you have the template plus the so the template is something that you know, lots of people will reference. That's slow changing. There's not many of them, um, and then you um, have um, instances of state objects, which is part of signed transactions, and the template plus the state object plus the appropriate signatures. Those things combined are what give you the the the, um, the, the legal contract. Oh, okay, interesting. Okay, All right. Um, okay, just before I move on, there's a couple of questions, one from Vipin on the, the chat about can the ownership be traced? Um, yes, we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, Jeremy's asking about, actually Jeremy's asking quite a few questions um, versus FPML. Um, yes, we've, we've done some work um, with um, integration with, with FPML. Um, one of the projects, just very quickly on this, one of the projects we um, we um, now did, but it feels like a long time ago now, but it was back in April. It was showing, um, and this was public, um, it was uh, uh, led by one of our members, um, Barclays, um, showing how um, a, a um, you know, sort of like two parties to a deal, to this, in their case, an interest rate, um, an interest rate swap, could, could, could collaborate that, collaborate with it um, in such a way that they could produce the appropriate documentation, in, in that case, is to the the, um, the, the standard, the standards body for derivatives, and, and have that information flow straight onto the ledger. We didn't use FPML for that, but that will, um, that, that's something we'll get to later. Um, privacy, um, yeah, I know that's um, a key question. I will get to that in a moment. I'm also conscious that I don't want to consume all the time on this call. So, Chris, unless you tell me otherwise, I'll try and be done by 40. Um, but if um, you want me done before that, shout in a minute. Uh, I, I think that should be good because I think I understood from Vip and, and Arno that they did not have a, uh, a long discussion. Cool. Okay. Um, so, um, so I, I won't uh, I won't dwell on the next few charts except to say that state objects you can think of as the as the as, as the system at rest that they are the facts that are recorded by the system. State objects are immutable. 
Um, this is this is this is it, it, it's it, it's very different to the Bitcoin UTXO model. But if you're familiar with that, the idea of states that are produced by transactions consumed by other transactions, um, that's the right mental model to have. So the way to think of um, way to think of Calder is at rest. There's a whole bunch of state objects that represent the current state of your node, um, and you have just the objects that, that that pertain to you or which you've needed in order to verify transactions. And I'll get to that in a minute. And transactions are how the system, how the states evolve. So a transaction either produces new states, such as an issuance transaction as we have here. So a state that previously didn't exist comes into life. And when it's appropriately signed and distributed to the right parties, there's now a new state object representing a new contract on the system. Um, and um, the states can also you say states must have the impression of evolving because an existing state, perhaps money that's currently owned by me, I can pay it to somebody else, um, and, it, and I do that through a transaction. It consumes zero or more input states, so they are, they are now dead, if you like, they're no longer valid, and, and it creates zero or more new states. So, um, so a model um, based on basically essentially a set of active immutable objects and transactions consume some of those some of those some of those immutable objects and produce new ones. Um, yeah, yeah, so very much um, you know, in, in inspired and and, and 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 based in some ways on, on a UTXO model. Um, I'll get on to consensus and privacy on, on the next few charts. Um, the back to the transaction verification. Um, so we now think. We have this machinery. We have a, trans have a transaction which can consume inputs and produce outputs. This is now where the the contract code comes in, because if I um, if I once I produce one of these transactions and provide you know helper and um, helper methods for doing this, I then send that to the people who need to verify it, and um, their job is not to and this is important. It is not to re rerun the transaction creation and rerun the transactions um, logic. It is to verify. By that the proposed transaction is valid under the rules of the system, and this is quite important for quite a few use cases we see, where the the um, the, the the act of creating a transaction is either computationally intensive, perhaps in some nesting scenarios, or where the algorithm that's used may need to be proprietary, but where the verification of whether that transaction is is, 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 is is potentially valid or not is, is much more is, is much cheaper computationally or doesn't require proprietary code so, so that, that, that that ability to split the the, 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 the constriction of a, of a new state for the world from verifying its 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 um, it, its, its, its correctness it, it is quite important in our model um, but it should be said in cases where you don't mind everybody running the same code to verify then, then there's a you know as, as, as a trivial implication that that is possible. So, so how do we deal with, with double spends? Um, um, and um, so we think about the model we have here. We have transactions that consume inputs and produce outputs. So the obvious, the obvious, and I argue the the, the, the sole problem we have to to solve from a from a, a, a transaction processing and, and, and consensus management perspective is I could produce I could I could create two transactions that try to spend the same inputs um, to two different people. So the, the, the double spending problem that Bitcoin has. And of course that's that's what blockchains are for, right? You um, send the transaction to the miners um, or the validators or whichever whichever architecture you use. Um, and they 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 use a group that 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 mine uh, that, 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 that that blockchain cluster if you like is trusted by all all participants in the system um, to to select precisely one transaction out of a pool of conflicting transactions. And when when that when that selection is being made often by Often by grouping several of them into a block and allowing it to um, allowing it to be committed in some way, you can know that your transaction was processed and the other one wasn't. We we, we generalise that quite heavily, um, so we say that the, um, the 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 service being provided by miners in public blockchains by the um, you know, by the transaction processors um, generically in 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 private blockchains, it's a it's a it's a, it's a transaction uniqueness or notarization service that, it, that, it, that it's providing. Whether it's a single centralized node, whether it's a blockchain, whether it's a PBFT cluster, um, the service being provided by the miners is one of attesting that a given transaction does not conflict with another transaction that has previously been um, committed. But whereas um, I think other architectures tend to have a single um, transaction selection mechanism for a for a whole system, and there's a single blockchain, um, we allow multiplicity of what we call notaries, um, and that's for several reasons. 
Um, so first of all, these nurseries can can be centralised, although that's obviously not 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 um, not optimal. Um, or they could be um, um, in, in in some scenarios um, high performance raft or Paxos clusters, and in in more exacting scenarios, they'll be Byzantine involved tolerant clusters. Um, as an aside, you could implement a notary on top of an existing blockchain or on top of um, you could even delegate down to Bitcoin, but it's, that's not a, that's not a, um, a usage um, we envisage for what we're doing. Um, but, but importantly, you can have lots of these notary clusters, and that's for several reasons. One, um, for a global network, we may want, uh, there may well be a lot of transactions that take place only between parties in a single geographical area. Um, because we don't have a model based on sending data to everybody, that data can be localized. Let's say to London can be um, can be localized to the parties in London who are trading with each other, and they can be a high performance notary that they all trust in London. Um, but they can also um, interact with parties for other purposes you know, elsewhere in the world, where um, where perhaps a globally distributed PBFT notary would be more appropriate. Um, so there are so, so we support multiple notaries for those kinds of reasons. We also support them for for what we um, think for, for what we call um, onboarding reasons. It's, it's likely in in the early days of these these networks, our belief is that um, certainly for some use cases, um, many institutions will be very reluctant to rely on on consensus services um, provided by, um, by by diffuse groups or by by um, by groups that, that are outside of their control or which for which with which they. Um, you know, for, for, for which they can't necessarily be held accountable. So it may well be the case that um, you know, participants in the system need to self-notarize some transactions. So for all those reasons, we support um, what we call uh, we, we support what we call pluggable consensus. There can be large numbers of notary clusters, each running different algorithms and um, providing different qualities of service, um, but all part of one network. And that will be explained more in the forthcoming um, technical white paper. Um, just. Pause. There's a few other questions. Whoa, there's loads of questions. Right, I'm not even going to attempt to answer all them until I've just got a bit further, and then I'll whiz through them all. So, um, clearly, um, oh, yeah. Okay, lots of questions. Um, okay, um, so that was that was consensus. Um, very quick, um, quick point on one other piece. Because we uh, are focusing on the the, 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 the the creation and agreement of of legal contracts, and we know that this could be quite a complicated process. We also have something we call the flow framework, which allows developers to specify the, the backwards and forwards interaction of transactions and partly signed transactions between participants in the system. So you can think of this almost as a decentralized workflow or decentralized choreography um, um, feature so that um, if, if, if three or three, four, five, however many parties need to collaborate to, to construct a transaction and get it correctly signed, they can do so um, on the platform um, you know, using the same reliable point-to-point -point messaging network that, that the platform uses, but, but all that backwards and forwards, all that ephemeral data that is just there for the purposes of, of, of constructing a valid transaction, none of that then gets committed to the global state, and, you know, and so you know, the parallel is it, it doesn't bloat the blockchain in the way that trying to do workflow um, on, say, Ethereum often does. Um, there's a lot more to say on that, but, that, but I'll skip past it. Um, um, so, um, so, so privacy. Um, so the the mental model that um, that the people should be beginning to build upon build is that um, the transactions are only shared with those who have a, a legitimate need to know. Um, so I need to define legitimate. Um, in cases where the the, the the deal is, and we call these linear linear states, deal a deal where the the parties to the transaction actually are known up front and and, and, and change slowly. Perhaps the evolution of an interest rate swap, the evolution of, of a deal, then then the data simply is shared between those parties. So an example here, we see Bank A's vault, our name for the wallet, and Bank B's. There's an interest rate swap held between A and B. We see the, 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 um, the, the very top two green boxes in Banks A and B's vaults. Um, those, those, those objects and their evolutions will never be seen by anybody other than A and B. But what you also see is you see um, some cash states and and in, and in the cash case, well, you know, there's no magic going on here. If, I, if I'm a bank and I've issued some cash to you, and then you then pay it to Bob, and Bob pays it to to Charlie, um, if Charlie's going to accept that, they need to know they really do have a have a um, a claim on the Bank of Alice, me, who's just paid it to them. So it, so it, so in, so in, so in that in, in that scenario, um, in order for for Charlie, the ultimate recipient of the, the of the of the payment, to be sure they have indeed ended up with a claim. 
on the um, with a claim on the um, on the initiating bank, um, Bob, who's paid um, paid Charlie, um, has to provide the transaction chain necessary for for Charlie to to satisfy themselves of the provenance of that data. So included in the um, included in the architecture is the ability for the recipient of a transaction to to request its relevant dependencies um, from the sender. Now an obvious question is, well, hang on, Richard, you know, you're trying to pull the wool over our eyes. Doesn't this just doesn't this just degenerate to to a full public blockchain? Uh, and the answer is um, um, the answer is no. And the reason for that is the this own this this transaction walking only has to go back as far as the issuance of the issuance of the asset cash in this case so it's a partial transaction tree that needs to be provided number one number two we use address randomization so you don't know who the um, who the parties were for the previous transactions and thirdly because of the use cases we're addressing and looking at where the, um, the, the, the target is regulated financial institutions who have regulatory obligations to monitor transactions and ensure that, um, that, that, that inappropriate transactions don't happen. Um, in reality, we expect these chains to be very short because the issuers of assets will, uh, will have an active part in their processing as well. Um, but, the, but, there's, um, but, but, but I'm not pretending there's anything magic here. Um, the, um, the, the, the desire here is to build a system that shares the absolute minimum of data while still being um, still being um, uh, still having high integrity. So, so last slide, and then I'll, I'll look through some of the questions. So, so in summary, um, we've um, talked about states. Uh, so, data is shared on a need-to-know basis. So, nodes, as I just said, will provide the dependency graph of a transaction um, if, if necessary for that the receiving node to be able to to, to verify it. Um, but there's no global broadcast. Um, more technically, um, states um, we persist. We have an embedded relational database. We'll um, will support um, external relational databases so that information that's processed by the nodes can be can be joined with private data held by um, by by um, by banks. There is a, a scheduler um, built in so that states can ask to be woken up or for transactions to be run in the future. Because of the UTXO model and the no global broadcast, transactions can happen in parallel on different nodes without either node even knowing the other one is doing anything. Um, and we talked about how it's, um, it, it, it's, we're targeting the, the, the job of virtual machine. Um, a couple of other noteworthy points. Because we don't broadcast data and we have very precise needs around where data flows, nodes are actually arranged in an authenticated peer-to-peer -peer network. Communication is direct and it's over uh, reliable store and forward messaging. So there's an underlying MQ, net MQ network um, upon which um, Corda runs. Um, and then finally, as we discussed, you know, the, the, there are no blocks. Transactions are notarized individually and we support um, pluggable consensus and multiple consensus mechanisms um, running at once. Um, it will be open sourced on November the 30th. Um, there's still a long way to go. The code is, um, we're very, very pleased with the progress the team has made, but there's still a long way to go. So, um, so we're really looking forward to, to working with the community to, um, to, um, to see to what other uses it can be put, but also to, um, to encourage a large, large range of contributions. Um, I'll pause there. I said I'd be done by 40. Oh, wow, it's just ticked over to 40. Um, but I know there's a whole bunch of questions. So, um, so I'll pause, um, but I'll, then I'll, I'm happy to answer a few questions. Chris, yours, target the job of a virtual machine. Um, we're actually writing in a language called Kotlin, um, which you can think of. It's from JetBrains you, as, a, um, as a sort of like a more modern Java, but without, without the complexity of, um, of Scala. Um, we found it to be very, very productive. And our developers, with the exception of one, None of them knew that language when they joined, and within a week they were all productive. It's very concise and very productive. So I'll pause there for questions or for us to move on. Thanks, Richard. Um, any remaining questions for Richard, or uh, maybe we can just sort of take the. Richard, or uh, maybe we can. So I didn't hear that, sir. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't catch the question. Looks like there could be many questions. So there was a proposal. Looks like there could be I, many questions. So there was a proposal okay. I, to have it uh, sent on the mailing list. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm very happy for that. We, um, although the code won't, we're still um, getting it into the state we want. The code won't be up on November the 30th, but we're very happy to discuss on the mailing list. Um, yeah, very, very happy to. Yeah, I think I see Hart suggested that as well. I'm delighted to. Yeah. Um, I'm, 
Actually, I just a couple of other questions. Mick Mintel's asked, you know, the language and assumptions are very financial. Will this work for other usages? That, that's a very fair point. Um, we we wanted to we wanted to have a very firm and clear set of requirements so we could engineer against something real, if you like. And finance is clearly where this this comes from. But when you look at the underlying architecture, you know, state objects representing agreements between parties, transactions that evolve them. Um, the actual the actual machinery is 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 is, is very general purpose. We chose a specific domain, understandably. We chose a specific domain um, for the um, for, for to, in order to, to to drive a coherent architecture. But um, but I, I'd expect to see a lot of use outside finance as well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Richard. That was. Um, uh, I I know personally, I'm I'm really excited about this, and uh, I'm glad that R three is doing this. So um, we look forward to. See how this evolves. Um, so let's let's do that. Let's take any remaining questions to, um, uh, I guess, the Hyperledger dash uh, technical discuss list would probably be appropriate. Right, and I'll ask, I'll ask some of the team to jump onto that as well. Right, and I'll ask. Super, super. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Richard. And uh, so now let's transition to Vipin. Vipin, are you on uh, off mute? Yes. There you go. So this is to revive uh, something that was actually in the initial um, proposal uh, for the project template proposal. It is actually there in the proposal, which says that every project that is um, incubated or somehow considered uh, to be part of the Hyperledger would have a number assigned to it, much like the numbers assigned to a Bitcoin improvement proposal or Ethereum improvement proposal or any of the other systems where there are large numbers of uh, proposals or projects incubated. So that that would, you know, basically the point is that somebody's got to assign these numbers. There, there has to be an editor or someone uh, either from the Linux Foundation or somewhere else who would say, okay, now that this project is accepted for proposal, this is the number assigned to it. That allows us to gather them together in a single uh, matrix or, or a place where each proposal, numbered proposal and its description and everything, you just click on it and you go to that uh, project. So this is more of an organizational, uh, you know, or a governance kind of thing. Um, and I, and I think in the beginning, you know, when there were only two, it was all right. But now we are, we have at least five or six, and now more with Corda. Uh, so that is essentially the thrust of, uh, what, you know, what I wanted to say, and basically. We have to assign numbers and to organize ourselves in a way that the wiki is easier to navigate and everything is easy to find, at least on the top level. That's it. <clears throat> Thanks, Ripman. So, I mean, what what I had been doing, and of course, I'm um, I, I need to go in and do some cleanup on as we transition to the wiki, but was to have all of the proposals added to the wiki and and link directly from there and then to update to indicate the status whether it was being reviewed or um, approved and then linking to the minutes of the minute uh, the meeting in which they were approved or you know, obviously gave them being. Um, so yeah, that has been my intent. I don't know that we necessarily need to have a numbering scheme but I mean we could. Um, but then I was just linking to the wiki with the title so that people could figure out what they were looking for. Well, the number is in the uh, original uh, template that the TSC approved. So although we didn't set up a mechanism for doing so, uh, it's already there. It's not a new thing. Yeah, no, I, I, I understand. I understand. But then it's a matter of maintaining some sort of, you know, like you said, editorial oversight over the number assignment and so forth. But um, yeah, we could we could do that. Um, I 
I don't see a problem with what, what do people think. Don't all speak at once. Yeah, uh, resounding silence. Is, is the silence agreement, disagreement, or? So this is Arno speaking. Can you hear me? Yep. So I, you know, I kind of feel like Chris. I think, you know, I don't mean to push back because I understand it was in the proposal we accepted initially. And so maybe we should just implement what we had agreed to. But I understand the numbering scheme would be a good way to force some kind of organization. But fundamentally, it's just another piece of information that you have to keep track of at the same time. So. I'm all for making sure that we have a clear list of all the different projects that are going on and get better organized on the week in this regard. I don't know that you know uh, we necessarily need to have a numbering scheme for that. But again, you know, I wouldn't push it back if uh, Vipin thinks it's important. That's fine with me. Not that I think it's important. I I'm just following practices, good practices that have been uh, followed in other projects and it seems to work because you say BIP 30, you know, BIP 32, you know what, what it means. Actually, you know, the guys who are in the, uh, in, in the Bitcoin world, for example, would know that. Uh, so it becomes uh, more of a reflexive thing and a, and a path towards a process. It is not, uh, you know, anything magical. It is just, a way to organize yourself and since you follow this process at least you know this is a very very uh, sort of elementary thing I mean it's not even that complicated uh, it's been there ever since internet like you know RFC is numbered and if you search for a number RFC number then you know what it is uh, these kind of schemes have been there for a reason because it's, it's there in an open community uh, and everybody refers to each project with different uh, names. Uh, so when there is the commonality, at least with this numbering scheme, you get that. If you if you really feel like it, it should not be there, I'm not going to stand against it. But you know, I feel it's a good idea because you're getting more and more projects into incubation, and to organize it better, it would be better to do it. Uh, that's all I have to say on the matter. Okay. Um, well, I already have to go through and do some spelunking because I, I, after Sawtooth, <laughs> I never went back and, and linked to the uh, to the TSC minutes when the uh, the proposal was approved. So. Hi, hi. This is Jared. So I'm actually supportive of this. I actually think we're all kind of implicitly saying the same thing. Right, there's going to be a list of projects somewhere. Like that's just a kind of a standard organizational tool. So, just kind of the bookkeeping of a, you know, whenever whenever something comes across your table, give us the next number in the series. I think makes sense because as time goes on, it's highly probable they're going to have many projects with very similar sounding names. Um, and you know, since we already have to have a tabulated list of this, or we should have a tabulated list of it somewhere, just from an organizational standpoint, I don't see necessarily being problematic to just in the next column just say okay you know this is project one this is hit one this is hit two you know just as they come in and whoever's updating that list so someone's updating you know maintaining this list somewhere just give it the next number in the sequence this way there's no ambiguity uh, you know about different names or, or similar sounding names as you kind of go forward so I, I do think that there's probably value to the proposition and I, I don't it doesn't seem that what anyone's saying is, is kind of an odd spot. I mean, people are saying, "Oh, well, we should have a tool to keep track of it." And list of all the you know list of all the projects. Okay, so if you have that, then there's pretty much zero overhead just to put a number next to it as well. So, I, I, and I do see that there's a potential for some ambiguity and similarity in naming conventions of projects that could potentially um, cause some confusion. So, I think this would make it kind of unique and unambiguous. But that's my opinion. Okay. I think that makes sense.
So I, I don't think we actually need to make a decision per se unless somebody wants to object to implementing what we have agreed to. It's more a matter of implementation. And, it's implementation uh, it means uh, yeah, we got to go in and, and do the work. So uh, like exactly. I said, I have uh, sort of on my to-do list to go through and clean up the, the proposals page um, with links to the minutes where they were discussed and approved and so forth, and I can add numbers. <clears throat> Thank you, Chris. Yep. Okay, thanks, Vipin. Uh, unless anybody disagrees, we can move to our no. Yes. So, code of conduct is a very small matter, and I don't think it's going to be very controversial either. But uh, so, in the code of conduct that we have adopted, there's a section on incident procedure that basically um, directs people to report problems of incidents to a mailing list. It's conduct at least .org. There is the, uh, the Linux Foundation is in the process of trying to advocate the adoption of this code of conduct by other projects so that they would have a standard code of conduct across the board. And uh, in, in the process of that, one of the, the project said that they were reviewing our code of conduct and somebody raised an issue against using a mailing list. The reason being that it might actually discourage people from reporting abuse because they don't know who it is being sent to. And uh, what if, you know, the person you might want to report to is actually on that list for that matter. And so I actually check with the Earth VC because, as you know, we basically took the code of conduct from the Earth VC and then adapted it. They actually have a much more elaborate incident procedure, and I checked. They do not use a mailing list for exactly that reason. And uh, so the basically what I think, you know, it makes sense to me, and this is clearly something we didn't think about when we adapted the, uh, the Earth VC code of conduct to, for us. And so what it would require basically is to identify at least two people so that we can name the people, give uh, their email address as opposed to use some kind of opaque mailing list for the incident procedure. Of course, so, the question is who, that's, who these people are. Right. So, um, and, and Todd, uh, help me out with how this was um, implemented or not, as the case may be. But the, the, the mailing list that we have is really just a mailing alias, right? And it's not like a public, transparent list that anybody can subscribe to and people can see what's going on. But it's a link to like Brian and Todd and, and some others um, uh, that are part of uh, members of the staff, if I, were, if I recall correctly, of how um, we agreed to go off and, and do this. So it's not really a mailing list. It's really um, uh, a proxy, uh, you know, an email alias, if you will, for um, those that are responsible for following it, following through on, on incidents um, that potentially violate the code of conduct that people want to report. So, I mean, I, th I think I would agree if we were posting these things to a public mailing list that anybody could subscribe to and then you see your name go by saying, well, that Chris guy is being a real jerk today, you know, then I think that would be cool. But, um, no, but again, the problem that they, it's not just that, you know, other may, people may subscribe to the list. I understand that. The problem has to do with you don't know who it is going to specifically. So, again, you just said maybe it's Brian and Todd or you on it. I don't know that. What if I want to report against you? You know, I don't know. I'm not going to be comfortable sending it to that alias, not knowing who it is going to. So that's the point that is being brought up. So um, can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Well, from Linux Foundation. Uh, we, For most of our other code of conduct, we do identify specific individuals who would uh, be the appropriate contacts. Uh, we like to give out more than one in case, you know, one of the people listed is actually one of the pre one of the people that's being you know complained about um, in this case you know for instance we could put you know a couple people from the Linux Foundation and one person from the community or two people from the community if it would be helpful um, but you know the key thing to do is to ensure that we also have a back-end sort of procedure that if one of us is contacted um, you know that there's 
a routing mechanism to make sure that uh, we handle it in a structured standard way. So if you put, you know, for instance, two people from the Hyperledger community and two people from the Linux Foundation, um, if any one of us is contacted, you know, there should be sort of like a, a path, you know, for what happens once we're contacted. Um, that's, that's all that I, my biggest concern, just so that one person isn't going off and, you know, sort of handling this on their own without proper oversight and guidance. Um, some of these issues that come up at various points may require legal counsel to get involved. Um, there may be, you know, some challenging conversations to be had and uh, throwing that onto, you know, random one of four people is not in a proper way. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, 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 Mike, you're you're saying basically that in the others that you've done, there are individuals that are identified, but it still goes to some sort of an alias. Is that what I heard? No, there's no alias that it used at all. Um, for instance, it'll say contact Angela Brown at Angela A Brown at LinuxFoundation.org or Mike Dolan at M Dolan at LinuxFoundation.org. Then doesn't that have the the, the characteristics that you just described where then somebody's running off and potentially dealing with this without sort of having that, you know, sort of full process. Well, in it, place. So Angela and I are involved in pretty much any incident that comes up. Um, yeah. So for instance, if it came to one of the two of us, we know exactly how to handle it. If it, if you add, you know, somebody from the community to that list, so it's Angela, Mike, or, you know, Dave, uh, I don't think there's a Dave on here, but I'll just use that random name, uh, and it goes to Dave, what we wouldn't want is for Dave to go off and try to handle it on his own or send, forward it to a mailing list. You know, we need to make sure that Dave is clued in in terms of, you know, how to properly handle an issue that's raised. That's my only point there. Okay. Um, I mean, I, 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 well, okay, I, I suspect that's okay, except, I mean, again, I, I'm just sort of... Um, if you just want to keep it to the Linux Foundation staff, um, Angela or I, 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 think, I think that's probably the most appropriate thing. And maybe you know, um, if we just list who the the, the, the representative is, Angela and, and Mike, then you know, let's let's do that. Um, uh, although, again, I think administratively, if whoever it is that Jim assigns responsibility to is just added to an email alias that actually makes administration that a little bit easier than having to go through and update all these pages. Um, I, I understand that the uh, email alias is an easy way to handle it. The challenge is just we, we get this feedback a lot on projects that have done this is that the person who is potentially submitting something doesn't know who that's going to and is therefore reluctant to submit through that process and then uses some other process and it goes to somebody outside of the chain of normal response. Well, I, you know, my preference would be then that we just maybe then identify who it is and uh, I, I, again, I don't have a problem. I just thought administratively it would make more sense to do an alias, but I get, I get the point. Um, then I, you know, I suggest we update this and uh, you know, if we're going to do this across the Linux Foundation, which I think is a great idea. Um, I guess then it's, it's not really, well, I, I, there, I guess, you know, you're going to have like the, the Cloud Foundry, which isn't really technically um, the same as Hyperledger or some of the other uh, collaborative projects because it's its own legal entity. Um, you can't necessarily have the whole automatically updated to, to be one. But. No, but I don't think we need to go that far. Right. I mean, we just need to, to yeah. have two or three people for our project, and when people adopt it, they are going to make their own copy and change the names, and that's fine. Yeah. Okay. And by the way, uh, for reference, uh, you know, the W3C, they only list W3C people on that list. Uh. They have a whole yeah. bunch of people because they chose different, uh, like a person for each of their site, physical sites, but that, we don't have to do that obviously. But uh, what I'm saying is I don't think it's a case where we need to have somebody from the community. So I think having two yeah, or three I'm people from the Linux Foundation is fine. All right, I agree with that. 
So if everybody agrees, I think this is mostly tutorial I can work with Mike and we can add a couple of names there and uh, be done. I think that works and we're over time anyway, so I think that's going to have to be the res resolution here. Okay. Well, good call, people. Um, again, we are uh, out of time, so I just request that the work group chairs each send a, a brief update to the mailing list so that we can keep track of what's going on. It's been a couple of weeks, so if you haven't posted one recently, it would be appreciated if you could do so. Um, and with that, I think we'll uh, end the call. Thanks, Russ. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Thank you.